Hello, it's me, and I'm opening up the collection that I have of my Fishard puzzles based on requests that I've had for a couple of Fishard solves. Anyway, here's the Fisher 3x3x2, interesting color pattern. This is a cuboid, a domino cuboid, um, the Fisher 3x3, which anybody can get, which is mass produced. Fisher 3x3x5, which was, uh, again, um, custom made, shape shifting cuboid. Uh, Fisher. 3x3x4, three three domino, cuboid, 180 degree turns in this direction over here. Interesting sticker pattern as well, so it's a super cuboid. And then the mass produced Fisher 4x4, four four, which I've had a request for. And a Fisher 4x4x6, by, uh, by by which I also had a request for. So I'm going to try to make good on both of those requests by solving uh, these two. Now, the whole key with this is actually to solve this, but to solve this, you need to know how to solve this guy over here, so I figured I would roll that in there as well. So I'm going to put these other fissured puzzles in the background. I have separate tutorials on each of these. So what I'm going to do is, is present a way to solve these easily. Um, some of the confusion that I've heard from some listeners are how to deal with some of the strange parody, false equivocation uh, situations that can happen with this. Uh, even with the 4x4, four four, it could be hard to kind of keep track of what centers go where and what edges go where. So I'm going to propose a fairly easy, simple, straightforward way of solving these guys and uh, see what you think. Now, I should say that you really ought to know how to solve certain puzzles. Obviously, you need to know how to solve a 3x3 three three to do it. You should also know how to solve a 4x4 four four and understand what's meant by parity versus false equivocation. Some of these concepts I'm going to review uh, again here as well. You should also be able to solve a 4x4x6. Four by four by if you can solve all of these things, that's really going to help. If you can't solve them, you can try to follow along anyway uh, because I'm going to do it as though, well, it's solved for the first time, but that would be a very good idea. But in any case, we can start off with, uh, um, with these guys here. So I'm going to start off with a fairly simple way of solving the fissured 4x4 to anyone who's having a difficult time with that. Then we're going to move on to the fissured 4x4x6. If this is not difficult for you, then you may want to wait and uh, until we uh, go through this puzzle. But I'll tell you that in order to solve this quickly as well, you really need to know how to solve this guy too. So why don't we go through that? Um, this is a really nice mass-produced puzzle. Uh, I really like the way that it moves cleanly. Uh, I don't have to struggle with the movement at all. Um, I really don't enjoy puzzles, no matter how fascinating they are, that make it very difficult to turn the puzzle. And I find that if I struggle with the turns, that just makes things difficult. Uh, so it's a pure puzzle. It's not a cuboid. So there's no bandaging. There's no issues. Uh, of that nature, so every piece can move, so it's a fairly easy scramble. Turn, turn, and I'm just going to keep doing this until I have a nice scrambled fissured 4x4. Abracadabra. Okay, nice looking complex scrambled puzzle. Show this to anyone and they'll be amazed that this actually turns into something that resembles a cube. So, uh, um, really nice looking puzzle. Anyway, so what is the approach that we should take with this? Well. There's a variety of ways that you can solve a 4x4, and there's a variety of ways of, of techniques that I've kind of accumulated over the years. One is to do the standard solve by reduction. What that means is you take a puzzle that's a 4x4, and you, you actually just reduce it to a 3x3 Fisher cube. You reduce it to a 3x3 by putting all the centers in, making the center look like this, with, with these parts over here, and then making the edges look like this by reducing these down. By reducing the edges down, pairing the edges, putting all the centers together, you then solve it as a 3x3. Three three. So you could do that. Or you can do a layer by layer approach. So the thing about doing it by reduction is you're changing the parity of the puzzle. Right now this is a four layer puzzle, which means that its parity is as an even layer puzzle. When I say parity, the strictest definition of the term uh, that I'm going to be using is characteristic of the puzzle as being odd or even. Now I've heard a lot of issues regarding what parity means and, and uh, uh, some confusion regarding that. I'm going to stick with the definition I've been using because it helps me in terms of solving this puzzle. Uh, but the, there's no sense in describing a concept if you have to use a whole bunch of symbols and talk like you've got a PhD and make it completely un non-understandable to any 
common layperson. To me, that's a non-functional way of defining things. So I'm going to do it in a way that hopefully is easy to understand, that doesn't rely upon heavy-duty mathematics, but is still pretty true to the definition. So it just means the characteristic, is this puzzle even or odd? So every puzzle has a parity, right? Uh, so this is a parity. It's an odd layer puzzle. This is a parity. It's an even layer puzzle. So we can't solve an even layer exactly the same way as an odd layer because the parity is different. You have further degrees of freedom with this. So if I were to take this and reduce it to a three layer puzzle to a, um, whoop, this thing loves to move, to an odd layer puzzle, then I'm changing the parity. But by changing the parity, I may have it in a scrambled position that could have never been scrambled in that position if I started it out as an odd layer puzzle. So then I'll run into a seemingly impossible situation of one side flipped up or one edge flipped up. That we call a parity problem. So when I say a puzzle has parity, what I mean is that it has the characteristics of being odd or even. So it's not a dilemma. Oftentimes when someone says, oh, this puzzle is displaying parity, it means that you're in an impossible situation. That's actually not what it means. Every puzzle has a parity. A parity problem is because you are in a configuration that makes it impossible. And it only occurs because you started off with one parity and reduced it to another parity and ended up not being able to solve it in the parity that you reduced it to because you reduced it in an impossible configuration. So I'll kind of elucidate that a little bit more. So, um, so by doing this, solving this by reduction, you run the risk, since you're going from one parity to another, of encountering a parity problem, which is really no problem if you know how to deal with it. So kind of learn to love the parity. The other option is to do it layer by layer. You solve the first layer, the second layer, the third, and the fourth. And it's a fun way to do it, and I welcome you to do that. But that is by no means the easiest way of doing it, and I did promise an easy solve with this. The other one is you can dispense with all parity and solve it parity free. Which again is, if you've got some skills with this, I would recommend trying that as well. It's another fun way of doing it. Parity free just means doing the first layer, the second layer, and doing it like an AI cube at the top. Uh, again, not exactly what I would call the simplest of solves, but it does avoid any parity issues because you don't do it by any means of reduction. Well, you do reduce it, but you reduce it to a 2x2, two two, which means you're going from a 4x4, four four, which is an even parity, to a 2x2, two two, which is another even parity. So because you're reducing it from one parity to the same parity, you don't encounter a parity problem. So that's the whole concept with that. So dispensing with that, we are going to do this by reduction. We are going to encounter potential parity. We're also going to be encountering potential false equivocation, which happens with the fissured puzzles as well. So rather than explain that now, let's just go through the solve and see what happens. So in order to do this simply, the first step that we're going to do is reduce the centers. I'm going to make the centers here look like the centers here. And the centers that I'm going to reduce are not going to be these first. It's going to be the top here and the bottom here. In this case, and in my colors, it's going to be the square center of the yellow and the white. So to do that, I've got two whites over here. I'm going to match other two whites together. Here's this. Match it to here. I'm going to take this. I'm going to bump this out of the way so it doesn't participate in this layer and simply move this up. You can see these two are paired and bring this up here. Now again, if this is new to you and you're wondering what the heck I'm doing, again, you kind of have to know how to solve a 4x4. Four four. If you do, you know what I'm talking about. You reduce this, so just reduce the bottom one, which in this case is going to be uh, the yellow. So these two are already here, but I want to move it opposite the white. So I'm going to take this and move this over to here. So bring it down and just bump it out of the way. And I'm just going to bring this one back down here. So I've got these two up. Now I'm going to take this one, pair it with the other one. I'm moving fast with this one because this is really not the complicated part. This is the easiest part of the whole puzzle. Kind of gets you in the mood for solving. I've got these two here. I need to move them up to this layer and not mess this one up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this part here, this layer that doesn't have any solved, bring it down in line with this, double turn to put it in that slot, and bring it up. So bang and bang. So now comes the first a uh, little bit of a hurdle, and that's the center reduction of these guys. So what centers go where? Well, this is a 4x4, four four, so you could place centers anywhere. 
Now normally what would guide us as to what center is supposed to go where would be the corners. So if I were to reduce this, let's say I put this center here and the center here, I know what center belongs here or here based on the corner. The thing about this puzzle is that the corners don't guide you at all as to where the centers are supposed to be. So we have to understand, we have to have kind of an understanding of the configuration of the colors here. Now I'm not much into memorizing things, but it is important if you want to do this easily to understand the normal color configuration, the standard color configurations of Rubik's Cubes. And what that is, is if you were to put the red in front of you, then in a clockwise way, you're going to see red in front, white at the top, and blue to the right. So red, white, and blue going in a clockwise fashion. That's standard. So you're going to see that here. So two, red, white, blue. And here as well, red, white, blue. Um, so it is kind of a memorization sort of thing. And if you didn't know that or didn't have that same color configuration, it means a little bit of trial and error. But for our purposes, it's okay to keep that in mind. So what that means is that this white is over here. In front of me is going to be a red side, white side, and a blue side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first put in a part of the red center. I say part of the red center because if, in order to get these centers in, you can't just put four red ones over here because that's not going to be the correct center. The way that this works, the way this color scheme works, is the center is going to be made up of two colors because the side is going to be skewed across like this. So if you look, look at the Fisher cube over here, here's a side. This is actually a side over here, which means that this is the center, and you can see the center is divided into two colors. So this false side over here, this false side, is made up of um, a center with two colors, so here and here. So when I reduce this with this, there's actually going to be two colors over here. And although this is the side that I'm working with, this is actually the true side, I'm going to have to bear in mind the false side that this is made up of over here. So what that means is the first thing I'm going to do is let's go ahead and put in half of the first center and let's make that red. So here's this over here. I'm just going to find a side that comes, uh, a centerpiece that comes over to here. So you can see this is matched up. Okay, so now what is going to go on? What's going to complete this center? Well, if this is red, this is red, this is not going to be the red center. This is going to be the red side over here, this whole thing here. Half of uh, the red center is going to be here, the other half is going to be over here. So this is red, white, and so across here, this false side is going to be blue. So I know that right attached to this red is going to be blue. And it's as simple as that, so just bear that in mind, as you know the organization of the puzzle. So I'm going to put in blue ones over here. So this is typical center reduction. Uh, I'm going to take two blues and put them side by side together. Um, I'm going to take this, let's separate this out over here. Actually, to make this happen, take this, move it up like this. That way I can move this part here and not worry about anything. So I see this blue here. I'm just going to match it up with this blue over here turn it to the side, and then put it in right next to this red. So this is my first center. And this center is going to define this is the red side and this is the blue side. And now from there, the rest follows um, just logically from here. Now in addition to that red, white, and blue color configuration, the standard configuration is what's opposites. Opposite red is orange, opposite blue is green, and opposite white is yellow. Now to those who have this puzzle, I'm not really blowing anyone's mind. You all know this, um, but this is something to bear in mind as you're solving this. And if you've not seen this before and you got this puzzle as a present, well, maybe that'll be helpful. So to start off this next center, the blue is going to be here to define this blue side. So I'm just going to put the blue one in next. Here's one blue here. I'll match it up with another blue here. Take this bring it to here. Now because I brought it here, I'm messing up this side. So when I bring it here, I've got to move this plane back. So I'm going to take this out of the way and move this plane back. So now I'm going to take this and I'm going to move it to this side here, move it to the side, get it out of the way, and move it back. Again, not knocking anyone's socks off, but don't worry, it'll be get progressively more complicated. So you can see I'm defining the blue side, which is one half of the color of the center. So what comes on the other half? Well, knowing that opposite, 
knowing the opposites, opposite red is what's going to be here. And I know that opposite red is orange. So I'm going to put another orange one in over here. I've already got one over here. So I can't help but notice I already have two oranges in this configuration. So I'm going to move it to the side and move it in with this blue. So move this to the side here. I got to move this in this configuration. So what I'm going to do is double turn it out of the way. Take this, cast its net right to where this is. Double turn it into its space. Bring it back. Okay, so, so now I've got the second center. So I'm going to start off with the third center. Well, actually, one, two, three, four. It's really the fourth center. I'm um, done the last two centers. I'm going to put the other orange one in over here. Now, this bears in mind what I call the sliding U technique. And what that actually entails is moving this to line up to where it has to be over here, moving it down from this plane so that it's in the proper position, bringing it, so I moved it down from the right, moving it to the left, bringing it down on the left. Now just reverse what you did. Move it, swing the U back to the right, move it back on the right, swing the U back to the left, and back on the left. And you can swing it back. So that's a way of putting this in without destroying anything else. So what goes next? Well, here's blue, opposite blue is green, so green is gonna go here. I already have this in, so let's go ahead and move one of these guys in. Now I've already got these two already made, so I don't just slide these guys in. Move this to the side, get this out of the way. I'm gonna take this, cast the net up to here, double turn this in, and then move this back in over here. Okay, so now I've got these. Now you're probably worried, thinking, uh-oh, we're on the last center and I've got to do a bunch of complicated moves. And the good news with that is that you don't. All these colors are, um, they're assembled here in the right center. We just have to put them back in. What I'm going to do now is look at these as the true pieces that they are. We're looking at these as center pieces, right? Centers that have to be reduced to a primary center. Well, the definition of a center of a puzzle is it's really hooked down to the core. And all it does is rotate. That's what a center is supposed to do, like this. This is a center. Well, that's not what, the, that's not what these guys do at all. The real center of a 4x4 four four is not these pieces. It's actually inside. Inside here, I don't know if you can see that, but there is a piece in there that you don't see. A piece that all it does is rotate just like this center. You can see that inside any 4x4. Four four. So deep inside uh, that screw over there around that is the actual center piece. So these pieces are really false centers. They move more like corners. And my contention is that all the pieces of a 4x4 four four are actually specialized corners. The true edges, these aren't really edges, the true edges are inside and are also hidden. These are pieces that are on either side of the true edge, and that's really what a corner is. The pieces on either side of an edge. So the real edges of a 4x4, four four, of any even layer puzzle, is on the inside. The true center is on the inside. These pieces here are specialized corner pieces that fit on both sides. So truth be told, these are corner pieces. You can call these corner edge pieces, and these may be central corner pieces very specialized versions of corner pieces. So why is that at all helpful? Well, it's helpful because, because I can move these around using corner algorithms. So when you get to the last layer, think about what has to happen. What has to happen is, in order for this to be lined up correctly, uh, these two have to swap. This has to come down to here, and this has to come up to here. If this comes down to here, then this is now lined up correctly in this configuration. This won't be yet, but it'll be close to that. So what I want to do is swap these corners. So what I'm going to do is a simple corner swapping algorithm. I don't have to worry about any other centers. I'm just going to swap these corners. The corner swapping algorithm, if I wanted to swap these two, is 2R U. 2R, UI, 2R, UI, D, 2R, UI, 2R, U, 2R, and this moves back. So what I did is I swapped these two corners here. So that's a classic cuboid algorithm. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So with your last center, decide what needs to be swapped. I'm going to swap these two, hold it here, and I'm going to let this be my U, this might be my D. This is one move, my R move, and this will be my L move. So it's going to be 2R, U, 2R, UI, 
2R, then we do a UID 2R, UI 2R, U 2R, and this moves back. So these two are swapped. And notice we did not change anything here. So now what we have to do is swap these two so that it can be in the right configuration. So that it can be you know facing each other like that. So same thing, just do a simple corner swap. 2R U, 2R UI, 2R, UI D, 2R, UI, 2R, U, 2R, and there it is. So everything is in. And now we can line this up with our center, and you can see all the centers are where they need to be. You can line this up over here. So the dreaded last center is really easy on a puzzle like this. You just treat them as corners and do corner swaps. That's all you need to do. No fancy algorithms with that.